land of the free, with liberty and justice for all, over 1.5 million adult inmates, roughly 716 behind bars per 100,000 Americans. Which of these doesn't belong? Good evening. My name is Richard Lawrence, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Foundation for Economic Education, based here in Atlanta. And I'd like to welcome you here tonight for From State in Crisis to Reform Leader, how Georgia's approach to criminal justice is impacting well-being. Our topic is criminal justice reform, specifically in Georgia, where the doubling in the prison population over the past 20 years has prompted community leaders, politicians, and many others to examine the troubling truth and consequences of locking up so many human beings, particularly young African-American men. The question tonight is not only how to address this human crisis politically, but also the role of civil society in doing so. That is, the non-government institutions to which we all belong. Rather than incarceration, what alternatives are in place that could help rehabilitate nonviolent offenders and reduce recidivism? How can we reduce our prison population in a way that doesn't sacrifice public safety? It is my opinion that mass incarceration of nonviolent Georgians and Americans generally does more direct harm to individual and community well-being. Incarcerating so many Americans costs lives, money, and opportunities for all involved. In addition, as politicians from across the spectrum have started to realize, the institutionalized war on drugs has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color and has helped drive incarceration rates nationally beyond those in China, Iran, or Russia. I speak to you tonight not only as a concerned Georgian, but also as an alumnus of the training programs of the Charles Koch Institute, which is pushing hard, so hard, to build coalitions across the political spectrum that address problems such as this. Three years ago, I participated in the Charles Koch Institute's Liberty at Work program, where I learned so much about the ideas of the free society and how they play an important role inside companies and nonprofits such as FEE to help them create value for their customers. The programs at the Charles Koch Institute provide a whole lot, including a stellar network of professionals with the sole aim of increasing the possibilities for human well-being. If you or anyone you know is interested in learning about what I learned and experiencing the benefits of this network, I encourage you to investigate the programs at charlescokeinstitute.org. And while you're on your phones, I encourage you also to tweet about tonight's event by using the hashtag justice reform. That's justice reform altogether, no space between the two words. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Director Jay Neal, who will provide opening remarks and then introduce tonight's panel. Jay Neal is the director of the Governor's Office of Transition, Support, and Reentry, the state body that seeks to address Georgia's incarceration crisis. Director Neal previously served in the Georgia State House of Representatives, where he was vice chair of the Public Safety Committee and chairman of the House Committee on State Institutions and Property. Neal championed the effort to reform Georgia's criminal justice system, co-sponsoring significant legislation. In addition to serving in his current governor-appointed role, Neal sits on the Charles Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections. Welcome, Jay Neal. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to be with you this evening. I want to begin by uh, thanking the Charles Koch Institute for hosting this, uh, this event this evening and uh, thanking our, our panelists for participating uh, with us tonight. This is a conversation that's a crucial conversation to be had, uh, not only in Georgia, but uh, as, as we're learning more about um, 
uh, conversations happening in other states across the country, excited to hear uh, how much people are talking about uh, the need for criminal justice reform. And quite frankly, uh, I would not have imagined a decade ago that this would be such a prominent uh, conversation. As a matter of fact, I would not imagine that I would have been a part of this conversation a decade ago uh, because I, like many Georgians, uh, continued to follow the path that we had been going down for a long time, and that was uh, incarceration. Uh, back in the 90s when uh, the uh, federal government encouraged three strikes, you're out, we decided we could do better than that. We did two strikes, you're out. Uh, those type things are, are what led to, the, uh, to that booming prison population uh, in the state of Georgia. Um, I learned some things early in my time as a state representative that began to turn my mind a little bit. Uh, and ultimately, in 2010, we elected a governor that has a very clear understanding of criminal justice reform, uh, criminal justice needs, a very clear understanding of the needs for reform, uh, and has uh, brought about very significant reform, both in adult reform and juvenile reform, and now in the area that I am leading, and that is the reentry uh, area, the third leg that he talks about of the criminal justice reform initiative. And under Governor Deal's leadership, we've done uh, a great deal for uh, just one four-year term uh, to be able to, ha to have some significant impact uh, in our prison population. Uh, we, we have seen a population that uh, was at about 56,000 with some 5,000 already in sentence in county jails, already under sentence, waiting on a prison bed. And that population is now down to 53,000. Uh, we have seen uh, in just a year a juvenile justice system that has a population down 14% and a couple of detention centers taken offline. And he's done, we've done it by offering community-based alternatives, uh, interventions that provide treatment and resources that are, that are necessary to begin to turn uh, those individuals that are caught up in addiction-driven crime primarily uh, to turn them from tax burdens into taxpayers. And I think that's a very important uh, thing that we've seen happen in the state of Georgia under Governor Deal's leadership. We learned when we began looking at the drivers of our prison population, we learned that uh, about 25% of our new admissions were first-time entries into the prison system, and they were nonviolent, low-level drug offenders, and they were going to the prison for the first time. Many of them would come out more hardened, and over a third of them would end up back into the prison system. Through the accountability courts and the community-based treatment and other alternatives, we've been able to, to provide treatment and services for them to avoid putting them in the criminal justice system and are seeing some very positive uh, results already with those, uh, with those efforts. It's an exciting time, and it's an exciting conversation, and it's very exciting to know that, that Georgia now is becoming... Uh, recognized across the country as one of the leaders uh, in our efforts in criminal justice reform. Uh, we embrace that. Uh, we embrace the opportunity not only to make Georgia a better place and to provide greater opportunities for keeping families together and providing opportunities for people to overcome addiction problems and become productive members of society, but we also embrace the opportunity uh, to allow people to learn from, our, from what we've done, some of our mistakes that we make probably, uh, but the successes as well, and we embrace that, and we're excited about the conversation that we're about to hear this evening. Um, I know the panelists, and I, I've heard uh, most of them speak, and I know that we have a treat in store for us this evening uh, as we, we have some very um, uh, well-respected and highly qualified panelists this evening. It's an honor to be a part of this. I am excited that you're here, and uh, I just encourage you to embrace uh, these efforts, uh, not only here in Georgia, but any opportunity you have to be a part of educating the public. That's one of the things that I think is the most important thing for us to understand is the public gets this. If they really understand what we're doing with criminal justice reform and they really understand the fiscal uh, side of it, the public safety side of it, the, the moral side of it, they really understand how all these come together in criminal justice reform, the public can get behind, and they've proven, that's been proven here in Georgia, and I think we'll continue to see that as we build in Georgia and we see this movement continuing to, to, to grow across the country. Again, thanks for uh, Charles Koch Institute for putting this on, and thank you all for being here this evening.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Neal, for those opening remarks. Um, my name is Ewan Watt. I'm with the Charles Koch Institute. And it's a real pleasure to be with you this evening in Atlanta um, for our event, uh, From State in Crisis to Reform Leader, How Georgia's Approach to Criminal Justice is, a, is Impacting Well-Being. Uh, this evening, we're going to discuss this key issue with our esteemed panel members before leaving some time for our other experts, you the audience, to ask some questions. But before we start, I wanted to provide um, a, little, a little introduction for all of our panelists um, uh, before we get into some questions. Um, to, my far, uh, to my far right over here is Marissa McCall Dodson, who's the Policy Director and Attorney at the Georgia Justice Project. As an Equal Justice Works Fellow, Dodson developed the Coming Home Program at the Georgia Justice Project, a three-tiered program addressing the many obstacles facing those with a criminal record by way of direct service, education, and legislative advocacy. Most recently, Dodson was an author and primary advocate for the revisions to Georgia's expungement statute. She also represents indigent individuals in the Atlanta area who have both been charged with felony and misdemeanor offenses and has co-chaired both the Political Action Committee and the Public Interest Section of the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys. Randy Hicks is the President and CEO of the Georgia Center for Opportunity. Under Hicks's leadership, the Georgia Center for Opportunity has played an integral role in successful efforts to expand school choice, improve adoption safety, reduce rates of recidivism, and elevate the role of the private sector and civil society in expanding opportunity for the citizens of Georgia. Recently, GCO convened a prisoner reentry working group consisting of diverse and influential stakeholders who utilized their expertise to identify and push for much needed policy changes in Georgia. Hicks is a graduate of the University of Southern California and Biola University. Francis Johnson is the state president of the Georgia NAACP. Johnson has served as state president of the Georgia NAACP since October 2013. A committed servant leader, he has served in ordained ministry for 18 years. He also works in private practice with the Johnson firm PC, attorneys and counselors at law in Statesboro, Georgia. Johnson, Johnson is a Diamond Life member and has worked for the NAACP in capacities including state legal redress director, state executive director, and southeast regional director. He is a graduate of Georgia Southern University and the University of Georgia. Okay. Our good friend from Texas, uh, Mark Levin, he's the policy director of Right on Crime, and he's also the director for the Center of Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Based in Austin, Texas, Levin is an attorney and an accomplished author on legal and public policy issues. Levin served as a law clerk to Judge Will Garwood on the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Fifth Circuit and staff attorney at the Texas Supreme Court. He graduated with honors from the University of Texas School of Law with his Juris Doctor and from the University of Texas with his bachelor's. Levin's articles on law and public policy have been featured in national and international media outlets regularly turn him, uh, that regularly turn to him for conservative analysis of states' criminal justice challenges. <clears throat> Kelly McCutcheon is the president and CEO of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Foundation. McCutcheon is a native of Elijah. Did I say that right? Elijah. Elijah. Okay. People with, Scottish, <laughs> people with Scottish accents are meant to say that word. So my apologies. Uh, and a graduate of Georgia Tech, he was uh, he was assistant vice president of the trust department of Trust Company Bank in Atlanta before joining the Georgia Public Policy Foundation in 1993. He serves on the Education Policy Committee and Healthcare Policy Committees for the Georgia Chamber of Commerce the Georgia Science and Technology Executive Committee, and the Public Policy Committee for the Metro Atlanta United Way, and as a policy advisor for the Technology Association of Georgia. Ladies and gentlemen, our panelists. Um, so because we're in Georgia and I know how important the manners are here, I thought we'd ask her, again, our friend from Texas, um, the, the opening question. Um, so Mark, I actually read, uh, there was a really good article today in The Federalist which talked about a lot of the, the good work that GPPF has done, but also about TPPF, and in particular mentioned um, you know, your involvement in a lot of this. And I know you sp you've always spoken very highly of the work that has been done in the past few years. So just to kind of provide this um, discussion a little bit of extra context, um, 
What has Georgia done to reform its criminal justice system? Well, it's hard to know where to start, but if uh, the last three legislative sessions here in Georgia have really been tremendous. And um, I think that as we looked at it, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with what happened in Texas, uh, in 2007, we were facing an uh, estimate that we would need to build 17,000 prison beds over five years. And we turned that train around and we ended up closing three prisons, three adult prisons, and eight juvenile lockups. And so uh, I think Georgia, of course, came along a bit later in the reform effort, but actually has done even more than Texas, particularly on the sentencing side. So our um, hats off, certainly, to Georgia. And of course, reducing mandatory minimums on drug offenses was certainly a, uh, a major step. Um, obviously, in the juvenile justice and the adult area, Georgia has uh, really expanded alternatives, such as drug courts. And so that has enabled judges and prosecutors to divert individuals to uh, these alternatives. And I think, as you look at the arc of corrections uh, in this country over the past few decades, what you saw was um, prisons came to uh, constitute 89% of state corrections budgets. And the cost of prisons grew not only as more inmates went in, but older inmates, health care costs for both the inmates and the staff. And so that crowded out funding for the very things like probation, drug courts, electronic monitoring, treatment, the things that could safely keep people in the community. And so it took an, a kind of a concerted effort uh, in Texas and Georgia many other states as well to say, let's reverse this. Um, let's not uh, have a counterproductive uh, budgetary approach where we just end up building more prisons and taking away those things that would actually keep people out of prison. And finally, on the reentry side, certainly uh, Georgia has made great strides. Um, when you look at, for example, now as of 2013, uh, people who go through drug and mental health courts can get their record uh, sealed, even for a felony. Um, and so uh, I think that there's areas that still, much more work that still can be done. But these are all examples that uh, many other states uh, should follow. So Georgia's more advanced than Texas. Because you're on the record saying that now. So. Uh, we already knew that. <laughs> I'll have to go a lot more Hopefully work I'll be a Mark. popular guy tonight. <laughs> now, Marissa, I'm kind of interested in a little bit more background. Um, what were the characteristics of really Georgia's justice system that really kind of uh, provided the impetus for reform? Um, so it was, we were terrible here in Georgia. We have the eighth highest rate of population, but we are the fourth highest in incarceration. Um, we had um, 50 something, 50,000 people incarcerated, um, the highest number of people under correctional control in, in any other state. We were spending well over a billion dollars annually on um, the cost of corrections. We were spending $21,000 a day incarcerating people um, who had committed nonviolent drug offenses. Um, so Georgia was doing a really bad, in, a really, in a really bad position before. Um, also, when you're talking about accountability courts, drug courts, there were less than 30, I think, um, in 2011. Now there's well over 100. Um, there's, um, it was less than 50% of the counties that were represented by drug courts and accountability courts. And now um, there, there isn't uh, that kind of um, devastating um, disparity when you're talking about the access to resources for judges. So we are looking, we are, um, looking better, but we still have a long way to go. Now, Francis, um, you know, I think as everybody in the room knows, the NAACP has long advocated for criminal justice reform, given the uh, disproportionate impact that sentencing has had on African Americans. Um, what have been the policy solutions that you uh, and your organization have sought to implement in order to address this matter? Well, many of the initiatives that the governor uh, has implemented along with the legislature over the last uh, few sessions, these are things that the NAACP has championed uh, over the years, and so, hallelujah. I'm <laughs> grateful that Georgia is beginning to see the light. I think that there is uh, still a much, much left to be done, uh, particularly around uniformity. In other words, where you commit a crime, the zip code you commit the crime, should not be the chief determinant about the length of sentence, or the quality of justice, or the diversity of the bench, or the diversity of the bar, for that matter. And those are still challenges to Georgia's criminal justice system. Uh, we still have to work on changing the culture. You can't tell uh, people to be afraid uh, of individuals uh, for electoral poli uh, political gain and uh, chant three strikes, you're out, two strikes, you're out, let's lock them up, get tough on crime, and expect that 
an about face is going to erase that. The NAACP serves communities who have been devastated by our failed attempt uh, to, to wage a war on, on drugs. And these are not numbers on a spreadsheet. These are families that have been ripped apart and communities that have been gutted. And so in the wake of the reform, we champion it. As a matter of fact, we, we stand with arms reached out to the legislature and to the governor to say, let's collaborate so the community can really buy into these initiatives. Uh, and, uh, but it, at the same time, we have to acknowledge there's a whole lot of collateral damage. Now, Kelly, rightly or wrongly, you know, conservatives kind of have this reputation as being probably the, some of the most, you know, traditionally of being some of the most vocal supporters of incarceration, tough on crime, lock them all up, whatever you want to call it. But you and your organization have, you know, for quite some time now, been some of the most vocal supporters of reform. Um, what's conservative about criminal justice reform? Well, we, you know, fell into the same trap of, you know, re you react to the high crime rates of the 70s with locking up people that are a danger to other people. Public safety is so important. And you fall into that same mode, that's the answer for everything. And Mark called us up in 2010, showed us some of the numbers, made some of the arguments. It, it, it made so much sense that, you know, we need to re-examine our premise. And not only from a conservative perspective, is it not fiscally responsible to spend money on incarceration that's not effective, but it's, it's changing people's lives for the better or worse. You know, these are people that could come out and become productive citizens. If they didn't go to prison, then we sent them into alternatives that address some of these underlying problems based on the evidence, then that's a conservative solution. So the key is being right on crime, not tough on crime. And having the evidence was critical to that, but also Jerry Madden and someone like Jay Neal, Jerry was the leader in Texas. And he came to talk to our legislators. And one, he could say most importantly that they passed these reforms and he got reelected. And he didn't get booted out of office, but he could say, look, he, that's the first time I heard the saying, we want to make taxpayers instead of tax burden. And that really resonates. So not only are you changing people's lives and doing the right thing, but you're saving money. And we're trying to find that money for transportation right now in our General Assembly, and it's, it's difficult. Uh, where are you going to get it? Saving money here, re-diverting that into more effective types of things, there's nothing that's not concerned right. about that. So not just a large, kind of considerable fiscal cost, but a, you know, quite a, quite a massive um, social cost as well. Um, now, Randy, on your website, you note that your principles begin, and I love this line, with an understanding of the dig dignity inherent in all human beings. Mm -hmm. Is that what's been at the core of your approach? To yeah, absolutely. Justice? I was listening to Francis just a minute ago talking about uh, uh, that these, these, uh, these statistics aren't just statistics, they represent real lives. And, and both, not just on the victim side, which we often think about, but on the offender side. And uh, one of the big mistakes that we have made as a society, and in Georgia specifically, is we've been quick to lock people up. And, uh, you know, the idea of justice, um, sitting with some lawyers, the idea of justice carries with it the, the principle of proportionality. Mm -hmm. And we had lost all sense of proportionality. And uh, the, the, the fact is that we should not be giving up on people because they made uh, a mistake. And now, obviously, we're talking about there are lots of different kinds of mistakes. Some are really serious. And in many cases, people should be incarcerated but we have spent far too much money and far too much time taking people who are of value, who do have an inherent um, dignity about them and incarcerated them very quickly and sent them down a path where they became, in our collective view, a liability, mm. a human liability, mm. as opposed to a human asset. And so that's really been the motivation behind much of what our work is. And Marissa, in 2009, the adult prison population in Georgia was hovering near 60,000. And the population is now down to 53,000. How was Georgia able to make that incredible improvement? So we're, um, we've spoken about it a little bit already, but we're talking about keeping people in their communities instead of locking them up. Um, so the idea about account you know, accountability courts and community supervision, treatment instead of punishment. Um, so that has been the impetus for um, 
the prison population changes. The, there's also the piece that you mentioned about some people we are scared of, and some people should be in prison, but most of them are not scary, and most of them are not risks to us that way. And so what Georgia has, um, has done a really good job at is diverting people who aren't scary, who are not afraid of, from, the, from prison and keeping them in their communities. And so um, that is, I think, the, the, the majority of what we're seeing there. The other thing um, is the mandatory minimums um, pieces and the, the reductions there that um, play out. I would also say um, that when we're talking about the, um, the drug courts and the accountability courts, there's also we're missing the mental health piece. So account, you know, the mental health aspect of this right. is huge, and you're talking about the connection of sending people who are ill to prison instead of helping them deal with their issues. So again, finding what, identifying the problems that people are having as to what got them into the system in the first place and trying to make sure that we can treat them so that they don't return. Now we hear quite a lot about that whenever people talk about you know, community-based programs. What kind of programs are we talking about? So the, so what they're talking about is counseling, um, um, significant and intensified counseling with the judge in the court and the, a peer group, a, a group of peers that they can be accountable to. The idea about treatment facilities and um, connecting them with employment opportunities and housing opportunities and trying to be um, more attentive to the needs of people that are in the system instead of trying to punish them for something that, they've, that we have deemed a, um, um, something that should be stigmatized or something that should be demonized, depending on what we're talking about. I think these programs really get at the social determinants that really, uh, from a criminologist standpoint, that really uh, lead folks towards, um, towards crime. And an improving economy helps that, but also uh, focusing on, there's been a comprehensive look at how our technical colleges become career colleges, how, our, how we provide access to higher education, how we integrate uh, and connect services that, uh, that make a difference, that break up those, uh, those cascading social determinants that lead folks to choose crime. And I think that uh, when people are presented with opportunity, uh, that they choose opportunity over, over crime uh, every day. And so it's, it's, it's partly what's going on in the court, but it's also about getting the other systems to work together and talk to each other. Absolutely. I mean, let's be honest, I think a lot of, um I think some people have made this point before, even though people are being involved in the underground economy, I mean, they're, they're really quite entrepreneurial, right? That's right. Yeah. So. That's right. It's about channeling. And we're, and we're missing out on it, because there was a study that came out some years back that said that there's, so we're, the U.S. economy is losing, what, $65 million from you know, people who are formerly incarcerated who can't find employment. So we could be benefiting from um, people who are in the prison system being able to contribute to our economy in a more meaningful way. And I know there's a lot of great programs, you know, in Texas as well, where people try and channel those energies towards um, the uh, more legal economy, but they've been very successful anyway. <laughs> um, so I guess I think this has already come up, especially Mr. Neal's um, opening remarks, where in order to um, in order to win this argument, and I'm going to ask Kelly this one because. You, you, really have to, you really have to address public safety. And I know that's something Right on Crime has approached. You know, the first, the first uh, thing on their website is focused around public safety because I guess that's just the issue that the public fears most when people are talking about reform. Um, has the reform impacted crime at all? You know, did law, how did law enforcement feel when you were talking about these changes? Um, and you know, has, has, has the public perception um, of, uh, uh, of, of, of public safety shifted? Well, in Georgia, in the Georgia Constitution, public safety is the first thing mentioned as the role of government. So that's absolutely important. And it would never go anywhere if people thought that you know, we're not putting people that you're scared of back on the streets. It's not a soft on crime approach. What was critical to this argument was demonstrating with data and studies that what we're doing has been tested and it has worked and it's lowered the crime rate. Plus we had Texas, who was a couple years ahead of us, that had implemented several of these reforms and their crime rate continued to go down. We've seen the same thing here in Georgia. As our prison population has gone down, our crime rate continues to go down as well. So it's, it's evidence and education that changes public opinion. And then you have the political support behind it. What, Right on Crime did a great job getting national leaders, 
pulled together, signing on to these principles that everyone supported. So you had visible leadership. And then at the state level, we did the same thing. We asked key leaders to sign on to this. So legislators knew not only did they have the data, but when people, their constituents questioned them, say, what is this thing you're doing on crime? It's like, well, look, all these people and all of these organizations are supporting this. It, it gave them the ability to be really courageous right. uh, in, in, in a sense to pass these reforms. Now, what's great about it is in our country, there's so much animosity between political parties it was great to work on an issue that brought a diverse group of people together and to get something done instead of gridlock. And I think that's going to lead not just to other things like prisoner reentry programs, but it's going to leak over to other issues like education, transportation, other issues where we can learn to work together a little bit better. So it's almost, and this is, this is I mean, this is really fascinating that you could almost make the argument, and I, this is probably even the case in Georgia, that support in criminal justice reform has actually become a political plus for some elected officials. Well, the governor uh, campaigned on that issue in, in his election, and I think that all the elected officials that I know that were a part of it campaigned on it as well. They're very proud of what they did. It passed unanimously in both the House and the Senate. Nothing ever passes unanimously in Georgia. I think that says a lot. Now, Randy, I think we've already heard a little bit about accountability courts. Um, what are they, and how are they helping families in Georgia? Well, it's the well, it's it's the alternative to just incarcerating them, and uh, what it gives people the ability to do. It, it puts uh, individuals who have committed a crime of some kind on a track where they can be held accountable for making uh, taking certain steps to put themselves in a better position and stay out of prison. It's I think it's, uh, I, I don't mean to be glib here, but um, I think it's a, uh, the, the name says it all. It, it's a great way to hold them accountable and give them a chance to succeed. Um, the good thing also, though, is they will be held accountable if they don't follow uh, the plan that's been laid out for them. Um, and that's something also, when we talk about criminal justice reform, that's important. Uh, people need to know that we're not suggesting that people not be held accountable. Um, but we are putting people on a different path, partic particularly those uh, low-risk, nonviolent offenders. We're giving them another path to get their life straight. So I guess what are the sanctions that are in place, just in case somebody doesn't follow? Um... Well, it, it, it could be, and, and somebody like Marissa can probably talk about this better than I can, but it's things like uh, getting drug treatment, getting in some sort of rehab program, uh, perhaps going to other kinds of therapies or trainings or counseling that can help them make progress. It could be restitution. So there are all sorts of things that are just put in place. And, and you know, I would say also things that sometimes are done like curfews, and this is on probation as well, but also weekend jail. That's something uh, the Hope Court in Hawaii has had great success with, about a two-thirds reduction in recidivism. And so we've learned a lot about behavior of offenders and actually all people. Uh, it's kind of like if you have a child who touches a hot stove, you don't wait months for them to do it many more times and then come down like a ton of bricks. You're going to prison for a few years. Um, so it's the swiftness and certainty of the sanction. And, but it ought to be commensurate. So if somebody is test, repeatedly testing positive for drugs, the first thing you probably do is a treatment response. If they're not showing up to the drug court, if they're blowing it off, then yes, they may uh, get electronic monitoring, they may go to jail for the weekend, but they can keep their job. Um, and that's one of the really, you know, if you look at it, when we send people to prison for these nonviolent offenses for a small amount of time, especially if they have a job, but we're sending them to prison for six months, they're gonna come out at a higher risk than when they came in and it's counterproductive. Um, so uh, I think we're really getting to be a lot smarter about how we do this. From a practical standpoint, what happens is, and it's, it, I've seen this in practice uh, in two ways. It's generally some sort of pretrial diversion. So the defendant comes before the court and the court uh, accepts a plea of guilty and withholds an adjudication uh, in lieu of sending you to this uh, treatment program which has a regimen that has already been talked about. And the person knows up front that if they fail to hold themselves accountable, that this is what they're facing. And if they fail, they can come back and be sanctioned up, up to the maximum limit that they would have been eligible for uh, had they gone to a trial and, and lost. Uh, and so th there's sufficient carrots, 
the carrot is that if you successfully complete drug court, uh, you don't get a conviction. Mm -hmm. You can move forward with your life. And you have the improved uh, capacity because you've gone to drop training programs, you now clean and sober, you have connected relationships in uh, the community that you're living in. And so that's what helps to reduce recidivism, not just uh, the, the stick of going to prison, but the, the wealth of resources that are also applied uh, to that person, to that individual. And I think the great thing is the types of judges, at least we've seen in Texas, and I imagine it's true in Georgia, that want to lead a drug court are the type that like to work with offenders rather than just throwing their gavel down and making rulings and moving on to the next case because there's this kind of longitudinal uh, involvement over time with the judge with that particular offender. And I think part of it is we know people relapse. So as long as someone is continuing to make an effort and they're just not saying, I'm not going to show up every week to drug court or every few weeks, whatever their schedule is, then I think most judges are willing to work with them. Mm -hmm. So just kind of on, on corrections policy right there, um, there's been quite a lot of talk around, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll just continue with Mark here. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk around something called a reform resume. And I'm kind of intrigued as to what one of those, what they are and whether they work. Reform resume. Yeah. When somebody's incarcerated, yeah. they, they go through several programs internally and they get graded on good behavior. So when they come out, this is something that if they ever decide, I guess, to kind of apply for a job, it's something that can be stapled. And, Right, and it's also, I think, designed to uh, give the employer some liability relief uh, that's right. in terms of hiring, and that's something we did in Texas as well. And these, uh, New York also has the certificate of uh, treatment or certificate of rehabilitation that um, uh, inmates can get. So I think it's certainly a very positive uh, thing to do. Um, and I also think, you know, Georgia, as well as other states, should um, also expand uh, the availability of non-disclosure, or in Georgia, it's called restricted access. And that means that uh, your record is still, can be seen by law enforcement and prosecutors, and it can be used to enhance your penalty if you commit a subsequent offense, but it's not visible to employers, to people, uh, landlords, and so forth. And of of course, this, uh, as you would uh, guess, requires a time period. It could be five years or seven years, depending on the offense, uh, that the person is law-abiding in the community. They've proven themselves, and now it's time to remove the scarlet letter uh, from their backs. So Georgia does have this restricted access, but it's not available for felonies, you know, when someone's actually been adjudicated for a felony as opposed to a diversion uh, through a drug court or otherwise. So I think that's an area, particularly when you look at like a drug possession felony uh, and some of the other low level felonies, that that's something that should not be on people's record when they're 80, that they did it when they were 18. And the other point I would make is, uh, I would suggest Georgia look at occupational licensing. There's 80 occupations in Georgia you can be excluded from as you have a felony. They yep. include a, a barber's license, plumber, um, sanitarian. Uh, all these different things. And uh, in Texas, we adopted what's called provisional uh, licensing. And that is that uh, you can receive, if you're ineligible for a permanent license because of your conviction, in most instances, you can get a license that's valid for six months. And if you comply with the rules of your probation, with the occupation, it automatically becomes a permanent license. Um, so uh, we really believe once people have done their time, they should be able to punch the clock. That's yes. always an issue that completely baffles me. When you go into a prison and there is actually an inmate cutting hair and then when they're released they can't work. So they have almost kind of more economic liberty you could argue when they're actually incarcerated, which is just crazy. So uh, Francis, uh, I, I, at the start I remember you mentioned um, this point you make about zip codes and it's sure. something you, that you're kind of widely quoted on. Um, where have we yet to see progress and what else in Georgia's criminal justice system needs to be addressed on this matter? Well you have Metro Atlanta, and then you have the rest of Georgia. Yep. <laughs> so where you haven't seen so for the those kind of, us of who reform, can't pronounce words I mean, there's, there's some bright <laughs> spots outside of Atlanta. Okay. What they're doing in Columbus, Muskogee, uh, in that uh, and those accountability courts is terrific. What uh, what they're doing in the Chatham uh, accountability courts is terrific. Uh, but for the rest of the of rest of Georgia, justice is is unequal. Uh, Something that you could be sentenced to a probated sentence in Atlanta, you could be subject to 10 years in the penitentiary in Statesboro where I practice. In addition, even where the legislature has reduced penalties, for example, uh, possession of marijuana greater than an ounce, uh, what may have resulted in a negotiated plea uh, for uh, 
a year in the PDC. Well, the legislator has restricted the limits to PDC to 180 days or less and has expanded RSAT, which is a residential treatment program in the prison system, which treats offenders. So now that prosecutors can't sentence you to greater than 120 days, 180 days in the PDC, they're bootstrapping uh, different provisions of the reforms to enhance the sentence. So that RSAT is now nine months. So what would have been, before the reform, what would have been a year in PDC is now a year and three months in PDC plus RSAT. So because we still haven't changed the hearts and minds of those we've trained over the last 30 years to get tough on crime, they're looking for ways to go around this, these measures, and we've got to address that. So it'll be, I'll say this too. It, it also, it matters who wears the robe. And outside the metro Atlanta area, the bench is not as diverse and the bar is certainly not as diverse as it needs to be. And I think the tenor of our justice is tempered by uh, the backgrounds of those who come to serve in it. And, and having, having folks who come from communities that have felt the brunt of our failed effort on the, and I just, it's sort of difficult for, confession is good for the soul, I'm a minister. And this is, we're approaching Easter and this is the season of Lent. If we could acknowledge that we failed before we turn the corner and say, well, let's try this, that might, that might help. So some uniformity, uh, changing the culture, uh, diversity at the bench and bar, all things that I think would be helpful. Now, Mar Marissa, as much as I kind of want to keep on talking about how great things are, uh, or the, we appear to be moving in the right direction, which is kind of rare for one of these panel discussions, actually. It's uh, especially when we hold them in DC. Uh, I, I, I really kind of wanted to. I really kind of wanted to talk about. Um, you know, you write a, you write a great deal about the racial disparities in the sentencing system, which I know is quite prevalent where, you know, the, we're based up in Virginia. So, um, you know, how I understand that some of this is you know on the way to kind of uh, we're seeing some positive changes and, and movements, but what else has to be addressed here? Sure. So, I think. And um, Georgia has done some great things. There's been some recent um, articles. AJC has an article out about um, some research that was done that there are fewer blacks going to prison now, that the prison admissions um, for African-American men is down 19%, and for women, it's 30% or something like that. Um, and so there's lots of different reasons for that. I think that's a good thing to highlight. But when you're talking about racial disparity in our system, it is still very, very prevalent here in Georgia and in most states who struggle with this issue. African Americans account for 30% or so of the state's population, but they account for 60, over 60% 60 of the prison population. An African American is four times more likely to be arrested for a drug crime than a, the white counterpart, even though we know that use is not, um, uh, that use is about the same, if not more um, white use than there is African American use. So I think until, I think we can talk about what the steps we're making in the right direction, but I really believe that until we can recognize the brokenness of our system when it comes to racial justice, I really don't think that we can turn the corner and consider ourselves kind of, kind of victor, victorious in our um, legislative and reform efforts. Yep, still plenty of work to do. Um, I, and we've already kind of talked on this, this uh, long process of reentry. So, uh, you know, Kelly, I, I'm really interested to kind of know you know, Mr. O'Neill talked about this, this kind of third tier, this kind of third challenge we face. When somebody comes out of the system, you know, there's the scarlet letter, there's the social stigma that somebody carries. Um, what has Georgia been doing to help people uh, reintegrate back into society, find a job, um, and what else could be done? Well, the first thing we've done for state government jobs, we've banned the box, which means... <laughs> When you apply for a job, you know, the question, have you been convicted of a felony? You know, you, so you're, you're automatically out of any consideration. For, for state jobs, uh, that no longer applies. So they're allowed to ask you that question once you get into the interview. Then you have a chance to explain what your situation was. So I think that, that was a great move. Uh, part of it is training. You know, the, the we have an incredible technical college system mm -hmm. here in Georgia. We're doing a better job of educating our young offenders 
um, so we've taken one of our best school superintendents and put them in charge of the prison education system, the juvenile system. It's one thing we haven't talked about. The first year of reforms were focused on adults, but the second year was focused right. on juveniles. And one, it has a greater social impact because these people have their whole lives in front of them, but the financial impact is greater as well. It costs $90,000 uh, to jail a, and put in prison a juvenile where it only costs about $18,000 for an adult. So very expensive. So you get the benefit of that, frees up extra money to put into other programs. Occupational licensing is something we continually harp on. Uh, it not only impacts people that haven't been in prison, but you know, great opportunities for individuals coming out to get a job. Uh, halfway houses where you, you don't just let somebody serve up to their maximum sentence and then cold turkey go into the community. It's much more helpful to have I, I, I let them transition, mm -hmm. teach them skills, you know, teach them the soft skills they need to be employable. All of these things fit together. That's our next great challenge. And what I've learned working with Mark, it's never over. Mm -hmm. We can celebrate all we want, but there's always things that we can do. So we've got to continue every year. It's great to have a whole set of, of things that we can do to make the system better. We're never going to fix it completely, but we can always make it better. Yeah, you and I'd, I'd like to kind of address what's still needed moving forward, particularly on reentry. Uh, Francis talked about the need for continued culture change. Uh, one of the great things, I mean, there are people on this panel who've been advocating for criminal justice reform for a very long time. Uh, the great thing is in 2010, we did get a governor who was passionate about it. And that does make a difference to have a governor who's passionate about and willing to push and work with a lot of different people to make that happen. That began to change the culture a little bit and that trickled down to agency heads, and they started viewing things differently as well. But the problem is, it's kind of rank and file corrections. I mean, we need everybody to think about reentry from beginning to end. When somebody enters the system, we should be thinking about what it's going to take to have them reenter, because virtually everybody who enters a prison, virtually everyone, it's really a very small percentage that stays in jail for the rest of their lives. Virtually everyone comes back out. We should be starting with the end in mind. And the workforce needs to be trained. The, the corrections workforce needs to be trained uh, to think that way, to understand the risk and needs assessment for each prisoner. And everybody working with those prisoners should have a very clear understanding of what those risks and needs are for those prisoners all along the continuum. I think you I would, mean, oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. excuse me. I would actually say absolutely. I also think that one of the places that we don't spend enough time, and I think, um, nationally, right? I think Georgia's getting into the discussion about reentry and where, where our next steps are when it comes to employment and housing. But if we don't do something about the stigma of what it means to have a record in Georgia, there are almost four million people who have a criminal record. That's one in, one in three. So if we don't start dealing with what it means to have a record and talking to employers, private employers and private housing providers and the people in our community about what it means to have a record, what, what's happening inside that makes them work ready and you know, rehabilitated so that you know, we're talking about ban the box policies, how employers are using criminal histories. And until we deal with the community itself and how they um, consider someone who has in encountered the criminal justice system, I think we can spin our wheels all day fixing corrections and fixing the workforce and making sure that everyone has a diploma if, you know, or um, has a piece of paper, the, re the resume, right? The idea that I have this piece of paper. This, it's, in Georgia, it's called a program and treatment completion certificate. So I have this piece of paper, and we have done some things to protect employers who hire people with those certificates. But until we deal with the stigma that that person has and even coming in with that piece of paper, we will not deal with this cycle of what, you know, crime and, and recidivism. Uh, Mark, I, I, actually on prisons, you know, we were uh, um, talking about um, just there, one of the one of the issues actually that seems to keep coming up um, is the role of, of is the role of private prisons and obviously in the private sector if you're a business you have different incentives. Um, uh, what is the is is the is the criticism of private prisons entirely justified or is there something there? Well, you know, our focus really has obviously been closing prisons. So, and frankly, in Texas, we've closed both government-run and private prisons. Um, as we've looked at it, the, the problem that we found is 
you know, when you look at the contracts that Texas and I think many other states enter into with private enjoy. prisons, there are many hundreds of pages, but at the end of the day, all those hundreds of pages say they have to be exactly like the government-run prisons, which generally means uh, low performing. Uh, and of course, uh, typically the lowest bidder. And so it, what you ought to do, uh, and again, this is, you know, there's definitely, an, even in our uh, government-run prisons, we have nonprofits like the Gateway Foundation come in and deliver drug treatment programming, which I think is great. We have faith-based groups come in. And I think, so we need to incorporate the private sector into what we're doing because oftentimes they can be more innovative and flexible than a government program. The problem is, as I say, the contracting approach that many states have taken uh, actually prevents any sort of innovation. And it also, uh, we need to, instead of focusing on the lowest bidder, have performance-based contracting like they're doing in the United Kingdom. And so there's some re-entry programs in the United Kingdom that 100% of the money is based on reducing recidivism. These are nonprofits, so they get zero if they don't reduce recidivism below the baseline. Um, so um, I think that that's something we need to focus on. And um, one of the other things as far as the collateral consequences that Georgia could look at is reducing some things that are felonies to misdemeanors. Yes. Uh, Utah just passed a law, and this is a very conservative state, uh, a week or two ago that uh, the governor signed. Uh, and one of the things that it does, in addition to strengthening uh, treatment programs and alternatives, uh, is it does reduce a low-level drug possession of you know, smallest amounts of hard drugs to a misdemeanor. Now, you know, it's potentially punishable by up to a year in county jail, so it's not like there's no teeth to it. But uh, that, that scarlet letter is a lot bigger when it's a felony uh, than when it's a misdemeanor. And I think we're looking at that in Texas as well this session. One of the challenges, though, is making sure the funding follows that. In many states, um, funding for treatment is a lot more when something is a felony versus a misdemeanor. So we want to make sure that we don't leave the probation departments and the treat treatment providers kind of inadvertently out in the cold when we lower something to a misdemeanor because that person still needs the same level of treatment. So to, the, to the point of, of private uh, prisons, you have to also look at the whole uh, prison industrial complex, which includes private probation. And of course, there was a recent decision in our Georgia Supreme Court that, uh, that really struck at the heart of private probations, who had a perverse incentive and were routinely sentencing people even on misdemeanors. So even if you can reduce crimes from felonies to misdemeanors, they were converting misdemeanors into uh, extended periods beyond the maximum time that one could be sentenced for a misdemeanor, and extending the, the fines collected beyond the maximum fines collected, collectable for a misdemeanor. So that a, a routine traffic offense might, uh, might run into two and a half years on probation at $40 a month, uh, and that the fine may total well into nearly $5,000 for a simple traffic offense. And what that does is penalize poor communities uh, instead of really getting at the heart of crime. Oftentimes these people would sit in jail collective, collectively for three to six months for a, a low level misdemeanor. That doesn't benefit the community at all. And so it's not just private prisons, which in Georgia have a, uh, a guaranteed quota, certainly not a conservative ideal, but a 90% occupancy rate. And they're actually litigating against the state of Georgia for not being able to maintain those, think about the perverse incentive, maintaining those occupancy rates. And then we match that with the, with the, uh, the notion of uh, uh, probation for profit. I think we have to, serious, there's some things that the government is, is chartered to do by the people. I don't think it's as many things as the government does, that's a conservative mm -hmm. idea, but the things <laughs> that the government is actually chartered to do, it should do well. And one of those is public safety. And so since this is the government's responsibility, it should do it in the most efficient and effective manner possible. And it should do it in ways that maintain and preserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, well, I agree that, you know, I'm staying at the Sheridan down the block. I hear they'd like a 90% occupancy. Guy. That's They're right. Well, the government. But in Texas, our contracts say our Department of Criminal Justice can back up a truck to a private prison and take the inmates anytime they want when we don't need the, that prison anymore. And uh, that's something that our correctional agency has fought to maintain. Uh, and I think that's right. You know, it's, and, and, you know, the private prisons we have in Texas, the state owns them, so we can, we, we rebid them out every several years. Um, you know, it's a tough issue. On the other hand, you've seen, you know, prison guards unions in California and Michigan kind of obstruct reforms. So you can have kind of a constituency for more uh, people in prison on either side of the ledger. That's right. And that's something I think, you know, this country struggle with, struggles with. 
I'm just going to go to kind of a quick fire round so we can get to some questions from the audience. Um, so, you know, starting with Marissa, I've got, I've got three questions here for each of you to ask. And again, I want to emphasize that a lot of great stuff's been done, but as you keep pointing out, there's a lot more work to do. Um, what can other states learn from Georgia's success? What opportunities still exist for criminal justice reform in Georgia? And what can the audience do to support criminal justice reform efforts in Georgia and other states? Oh, all three or pick one? You can, uh, <laughs> you, you, you can pick one. Can... <laughs> oh, you're talking to a lawyer, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you, so you have to rule the other two out first. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, let me think about it. Um, I guess I, I would say that I think um, uh, Director Neal and I were talking um, a few minutes before we came out about you know the partnership that we've been able to have and realize and the work that we've been able to do about, about finding common ground um, and moving in a reasonable and responsible way. So I, I always talk to people who are on both sides of the discussion and say there has to be some way to get to the middle. There has to be some way to get some, some ground. So I think that that's something that other states could learn from us because I think we've done that pretty well to try to bring in stakeholders. The, the council's been really good about bringing in people from all over the state to say, what do you think we should be concerned about? So I think other states could learn from that model. Um, in terms of what could we do better, um, I think you know you raised great points, Mark, about record restriction for certain um, convictions. You know, Georgia still struggles with what it means to move on after you have a record. I think the idea about putting people into accountability courts, and we've talked about this a bit before, um, it saves us money, um, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily, and it may, it may help people from not returning, but it doesn't necessarily move people out of the criminal justice encounter. So I think until we can start finding ways for people to really get out and be able to move past their criminal history, the use of the pardon, and how people are able to say, it's been five years, it's been 10 years, it's been 15 years. You know, we have clients at the Georgia Justice Project who have 30 year, 40 year old convictions that stop them from jobs, from having children pulled out of their home for 40 year old charges. So I think we could still learn from this um, and, and grow in the areas of reentry and what it means to move on when you've had an encounter with the criminal justice system. I don't remember the third question, so I will. It was just about what, what could the audience do to oh. you know, become more involved? Um, I think this is it. I mean, I think being aware of the issues, I think um, participating in your, your local conversations, voting, right, um, exercising your right to vote, knowing who your legislators are, um, trying to understand beyond the public safety discussion, and I understand how important public safety is, but when some of the people that I work for hear public safety, when they are trying to return to their communities, it seems like you're already afraid of them. So there is something to leading a productive life and restoring community, remembering that these people are a part of your community. They shouldn't be ostracized and excluded. They should be welcomed in some way so that they can too be taxpayers instead of tax burdens. Uh, I love what uh, Marissa said about uh, other states being able to learn from our um, kind of diversity in the coalition, right? I mean, this, this was, um, a very diverse group of people that have come together on a huge issue. Um, one of the things that I'd say, you know, one of the things that drove reform was just, quite frankly, desperation. I mean, if, if uh, necessity is a mother of invention, it could be that desperation is a mother of reform. Um, <laughs> that we were pretty desperate. The trajectory was not good on prison population and spending. Um, other states are experiencing the same thing. Um, I, I, I think that uh, moving forward, um, one of the things, I'll go back to what I said before about the need to change the entire culture, um, to retrain a workforce. I think that is just super important because, again, as Francis was saying, there are people operating with a different mindset, and it's a mindset that doesn't serve reentry in, per in particularly very well. Uh, the other thing we need to do, and I know this is very likely on, on Jay's list of things that he's working on, but it's having a better understanding of where the holes are around the state right. in terms of community services, uh, because that is a problem as well. There are some communities that are really right. well stocked, so to speak, with the right kinds of services that are needed for successful reentry, but there are other areas where the holes are great, and we've got to figure out how to deal with those moving forward. I think I'd return to the core values that uh, all Americans share. Uh, deep and abiding appreciation for our Constitution and the role of government and the need to make sure that government is small and efficient 
and effective. And uh, that's something that uh, we all can rally around. And certainly in the area of criminal justice, we should treat it like any other bureaucracy with a great deal of skepticism uh, and making sure that we hold the budgets tight because there's a, there's a prison industrial complex that developed in the wake of our war on crime. And people made a lot of money locking up folks. Uh, and they did so on the backs of taxpayers. And, uh, and, and that should anger conservatives and progressives. I think, and, and that gets at the heart of what life is all about. When it comes to liberty, uh, our, we should be uh, uh, in the business of giving folks opportunity so that they can use their, their American citizenship in ways, in the highest ways of, uh, that liberty wasn't designed to make our communities better, to innovate, to uh, continue to lead the world, and the pursuit of happiness. I am particularly interested in this conversation because uh, it felt like uh, the train sort of left and uh, nobody told folks who have been working on this for a long time. Um, and we looked at the reform measures coming from the governor and from the legislature with a great deal of skepticism, primarily because uh, what we fund matters. Jay Neal, for example, didn't have even a permanent office. He was like in temporary office space. Um, it's hard for me to find out how much money is actually committed to the reentry program and the budget. So it sort of felt like uh, maybe this is window dressing. But if there's a real commitment, then call those folks who have been laboring in these communities who've suffered the most. Call us to the table as well. Um, and uh, we know best how to work with people within our own communities in the sphere of influence. And so we want to pursue, uh, help Georgia pursue a better, a, a better pathway uh, in that pursuit of happiness. So let's just go back to our values of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Let's look at conservative principles, especially in the area of criminal justice, and let's make sure that, we, that taxpayers are getting a, a great bang for their buck, and that also that we're putting people over politics. Uh, Mark. The Texas model is now the Georgia model, explain. Well, yeah, and I would say uh, I think it's important for you all to know that uh, states like Mississippi, when they passed their reforms, I met with a bunch of legislators there, they really relied on Georgia, and they held that up to their other legislators there to convince them. And now, this year, Alabama, uh, with uh, a bill pending there, Senate Bill 67, they're also citing Georgia as well as Texas. So. This really has rippled nationally, and of course, Governor Deal spoke today at the Cut 50 Summit and really delivered a great address. So uh, that being said, there's a lot more that Georgia can and should, and I'm confident will do uh, with the type of leadership you have in place uh, with Jay, Governor Deal, a lot of your legislators, and everyone up here today in your organizations. Um, I think that uh, as you look forward, certainly um, one of the areas that I think is, is important to focus on is pretrial justice, people that are uh, in jail uh, pending their a trial, pending pretrial hearings and so forth, and they can stay for months, oftentimes because they can't afford what for many of us would be a very, uh, low bail amount, but sometimes the bail is set unreasonably high, even mm. for relatively minor offenses. So there are pretrial supervision programs, but getting to some, what you said about uniformity, uh, in Georgia and in states across the country, it really does vary widely depending what county you're in, whether there's a way for you to get out of jail if you're low risk. And by the way, we have uh, very effective assessment instruments to uh, evaluate your risk of either not showing up or being arrested again prior to trial. And uh, the problem is there's people that are very low risk for relatively minor offenses who simply don't have the money and so they languish in jail. And the research shows if you're in jail before your trial, you're going to get a longer sentence. Mm -hmm. um, if you're out on pretrial supervision, which is kind of like probation, then the judge sees you a couple months later and says, gosh, you're doing great. I think we should give you probation instead of uh, prison. So this is something to focus Focus on. I think also the suspension of driver's licenses. In Georgia, yes. for a misdemeanor, you can use your, lose your driver's license for six months to a five years. And part of this stems from a ridiculous federal mandate where the federal government uh, said we're going to cut off transportation funding if states don't suspend driver's license for drug convictions. Uh, but states can choose to say it's only uh, based on if the drug conviction was related to driving. And I would encourage Georgia we, to move in that direction. We did it. We did it. Oh, you did it? Yeah, okay. we did it last year. Okay, well, congratulations. Yeah. We give the judges Sounds discretion. I know, we give judges discretion now. So okay, that well, that's of, better. When, uh, when it's unrelated to a vehicle, at least. Good, good. Well, hopefully judges are exercising that. And then finally, looking at restorative justice, 
Uh, things like victim offender mediation, particularly for low-level property offenses. We're working with police chiefs in Texas to use that, and it's a way of having restitution, community service, and agreement between the victim and the offender, and of course, both have to consent to that process. But frankly, uh, the evidence shows you get a lot more satisfaction on the part of the victim. You resolve the case a lot quicker. The offender doesn't get a conviction, and so that is a great way to really go back to the fact that when someone steals something from me, I'm the victim, not the government. Mm. I think our greatest opportunities, there are a lot of things to be done within the system, but economic opportunity, breaking down those barriers to employment. The job is the most important thing these individuals can have. The prisoner reentry things we're doing is so important. Education-wise, regulatory, from the occupational licensure laws, educationally, uh, any other barriers. The stigma, I think, what we can all do from the audience perspective is to, it's going to be a human understanding. Meet people, volunteer, encourage people to go meet these individuals, uh, whether it's in the prison system, there are a lot of ministries and other nonprofits that are working there. And you see these people, they're people just like you that made bad decisions. And we've all made bad decisions. And I think when you have that empathy, you can put yourself in their position, and that's going to start to deteriorate those stigmas, which are so important. So I think economic opportunity is where we really need to focus. It's a good way for us to end the panel. Uh, Marissa McCall Dodson, Randy Hicks, Francis Johnson. Mark Levin, and Kelly McCutcheon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have my colleague Brianna running around with a microphone. Mm -hmm. So if you, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for a, a wonderful panel. I heard many things that I thought were, were great ideas. Uh, one thing I, I didn't hear uh, that I think uh, seems very important in light of uh, the skill level of people who are in our prisons, let me, let me first say the things I heard that I like. One was begin with the end in mind. I really like that. Uh, work uh, to improve all the systems and work to change the culture in the community. How do we do that? Uh, I, my uh, kind of hero, I shouldn't admit this in public, uh, is Barney, uh, who says, nip it in the bud, right? And, uh, and one way that we can do that is by literacy rates, by reading, by teaching children at an early age to read. But barring that, once they get into prison, make sure they have those reading skills and they, that their parents are offered, sometimes their parents are not literate either, uh, and offer them that adult education. In my community, we have uh, a heck of a time getting funding and even a place for our folks uh, trying to get their GEDs to meet, to study for their GEDs. So uh, could anyone offer uh, some solutions to some of those sorts of problems? Because and, and, and does anyone know the statistics? I believe it's about two-thirds of the prisoners uh, read below an eighth grade level, uh, if I'm correct. So maybe someone knows that. You actually saw a number of hands going up. So how about we, how about we take a, a bunch of questions and then um, uh, get our panelists, because I want to make sure everybody put their hand up. We have enough time to. Uh, so we can maybe take four or five, and then we can answer them all at once if you want. So there's one on education. It's a great question. We didn't really address that. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you all for a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, my name is Loveless, and I'm from 87.9 uh, The Globe. And uh, I just want to know, related to the prison industrial complex itself, uh, given the enormity of the profits that uh, inmates are creating in what amounts to legalized slavery here in America, um, how do we, you know, offer at least some short-term solutions by doing things like figuring out a time limit after one has served their sentence or probation where their sentence can be deferred and expunged, particularly in exchange for all that free labor that they gave to folks? I mean, as an interim until that problem itself can be addressed uh, and, and something more equitable can be put in place, would you... Any of y'all care to speak on that as well? Good evening. 
I'm a retired federal prosecutor, and I've done uh, white-collar defense work as a, a criminal defense attorney the last almost 20 years. Um, most po folks see public safety as being protected from violent crime, sex crimes, uh, increasingly uh, serious economic crimes. Do you see the uh, reduction in, in um, criminalization of moving from felonies to misdemeanors, uh, reducing the number of people who are nonviolent first drug offenders, allowing the criminal justice system to focus on those types of crimes as well as people who are recidivists? Mm. Yes. Let's take a couple more prosecutor questions. Hey, good evening. How are you doing? Um, um, one thing I thought that was particularly interesting um, that um, Reverend Johnson said um, was apart from culture change was that um, there needs to be a diversity. We need to consider diversity for the bench. And I think that that's pretty significant, especially considering the fact that in Georgia we have the fortune, I mean, to a certain extent, to be able to elect um, some judges for those positions. Sometimes. Um, sometimes, right. Um, and I think that in, in other places, even outside of Georgia as well. Um, so I guess um, understanding that, you know, 50% of black people are, have a record in Georgia, black males in Georgia have a record. Um, one third of Georgians have a record. Um, the fact that 13% in the South at least um, of black males um, are unable to vote. I guess I was wondering, and I was wondering if Mr. Levin and Mr. McCutcheon could answer these questions. Um, whether there's any type of um, political appetite, conservative political appetite to reevaluate um, some of Georgia's voting laws um, in the coming years. Let's just take the one down the bottom and then we can. Like that. Hi, as a mother of an inmate in the state of Georgia, I stand arm in arm with African American mothers. And my big concern is that we're talking about a lot of things right now. My name is Kate Bosch, by the way. My number, Daniel, uh, inmate number 1,9461150, serving a 15-year bone-crushing mandatory minimum sentence, okay? So I, got, I know what I'm talking about. What I don't hear a lot is the families of the incarcerated. Mm. Our stories are, are legion, and we, 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 we live it, we breathe it, we know the truth. So as, as you talk about getting into the communities and... and I love it and, and what you're doing. We really need the families to be able to have a voice, a safe right. and comfortable place to go where we're not, where our, our loved ones are not harmed. So address the issue for the families and how we can stand strong and stand together and, and help lead this, this reform movement because we didn't do anything wrong. Mm. And so thank you. Absolutely. So let's, let's see if we can answer some of these and then we'll go back to the audience again. If, if, uh, so I think we had one on education, one on prisons. Uh, we had obviously had the, the, the one on um, um, you know, impediments to, to, to voting, and we had one on families. And uh, we had the, the one from you, sir, about, um, I believe it was, uh, they kind of just looked around. Oh, yeah. Uh, around, it was about sentencing, is that correct? I think, this, I think the, the, the statistics are bad bear record to what you speak about in terms of education, seven out of 10 don't have a GED. I was, as a former professor at uh, Georgia Southern University in Savannah State, I would say work with, this is an excellent uh, moment to work with uh, the technical schools. They're all over the state of Georgia and many of them have, or all of them have a GED mandate within that community. And so, and many, and, well, shouldn't say many, all of them provide free access to the GED training programs. So wonderful opportunity for you to partner with uh, the existing technical, which I call career colleges, uh, and, and get folks moving in those programs. And the state, um, that's one of the areas that uh, Georgia has really taken, um, and the council and Jay's office are really mm -hmm. intentional, and the, the General Assembly have been really intentional about increasing skills and edu um, the educational levels of people who are incarcerated. Um, they've recently partnered with, um, I can't recall the name of the, the high school, the, say again, Mountain Charter, mm -hmm. Mountain Charter to provide um, GED uh, diplomas to, um, to people who are incarcerated. They started at one prison, Arendelle State Prison, with the female um, population, and so they're, they're already seeing some success there. Um, I think that that's one of the areas I think George is doing a really good job at just uh, understanding the deficits that people are returning to their community and in trying to raise the bar there. Um, so that would be my two cents Absolutely. on that one. Well, 
Okay. No, I was going to just ask Randy, because I know it's an issue he works on. What about the families? Ah, uh, um, it, it's interesting. Many years ago, we were asked by the state to go into um, kind of a blighted area, a poor area of the city of Atlanta, to help with relationship education. And um, we were just doing relationship classes, and we are going to be talking about marriage when and where possible. And of course, we got, got down there, and the leaders in the community said, if you're going to deal with relationships and families, you better be prepared to deal with prisoner reentry. And being a guy from the suburbs, I had no idea that those things would be so closely connected because so many households are affected by, uh, are, are, have someone under the, under the state supervision. Um, I'm not sure I have the solution for how to facilitate that. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about and that is being talked about more is making sure that when people are incarcerated, they're incarcerated as close to the communities that they're from as possible um, so that their families have better access. That doesn't solve all the problems. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot to be done on that, and I don't have a lot of answers right now. I want to just chime in quickly. Yeah, just one thing I think that Georgia could do that would improve the state of families um, is the food stamp ban. So Georgia is one of 10 states now who still has the mandatory um, lifetime bar on food stamps if you've committed a felony, a drug felony, or a, um, a serious violent felony. So what that means for people who are um, coming out is, with children particularly, is that you say, say I, you know, I'm married and I have two children and I committed a drug felony. Now my household goes from a household of four to now that I'm disqualified, it's a household of three. So in, the, in those households, do we as a people really believe that that person is not eating at the table? Or are, is that, that, that loss being spread throughout the family and affecting those children who now don't have access to the, the funding that their household needs to survive? Another really thing we can do is eliminate the corrupt and onerous vendor contracts where families have to pay $10 a minute to talk to their loved ones and have to re this is this is just this is just greed at the highest levels and this is where we do need government assistance to check the private market yeah i, I was googling georgia prison phone rates to see if y'all had that problem and I yes. <laughs> uh, but yes. the fcc made a ruling on interstate phone calls but most people of course are in prison in the same state as their loved ones so it's a state uh, issue to resolve um, I know you did ask about voting, so we owe you an answer on that. Uh, my personal view is that uh, people, when they're on probation or parole, should be able to vote, and obviously that's not the case in Georgia. Um, I think that when you look at the uh, rationales for why we uh, give people a sentence, it's public safety, rehabilitation, uh, et cetera, restitution uh, to the victim, which I think is overlooked often. Uh, but denying someone the vote obviously doesn't fit into those rationales. Um, and so um, I don't think we're ready for people voting in prison, but I think when people are on supervision in the community, they ought to be able to vote. That's right. The education question, I think, was talking about on the front end, mm -hmm. you know, the literacy rate. I think if you have a good education, your odds of winding up in the prison system are much lower. And just like in, in Georgia, sadly, you know, your zip code can determine the, your access to justice. It also can determine the quality of your education. That's right. And we've got to address that issue. Right. Yes. We got another, maybe like two, three very quick questions. I know I saw down at the front here. I saw a bunch of. Uh, no, I'm I asked the prison. I know. I know. And you're up. <laughs> I, um, I just wanted to expand on the. Um, the, the family, uh, I know, I don't know the exact, exact statistics, but I know that uh, a close family relationship uh, with someone who's in prison actually um, is a, a leading contributor to a reduction in not only recidivism, but um, positive behavior while incarcerated. And in addition to the phone rates and the distance families have to travel, um, meaningful interaction with their families is important. Um, I don't know, again, the exact statistics, but I know many people who are incarcerated have children, and their incarceration has uh, collateral consequences for those children. Uh, they can't maintain adequate bonds, um, even when they can take the opportunity to visit. Um, it's regulated by so many different things, and then they can't even really have meaningful interaction. A two- or three-year-old child has, doesn't understand why their daddy can't hold them or why their daddy can, or, or mother cannot read them a book or, uh, you know, play with them or interact with them on that kind of level. 
Um, even a teenager, a teenager, uh, you know, you got teenagers. Well, would the teenager rather go and sit in a visitation room and eat vending machine food while only being able to talk to their father um, in the presence of all these other people? Or would that teenager, you know, maybe like, who, who, you know, they already don't have the close relationship. Um, they should have relationship building apparatus like games, things like that available that aren't serious security risks or anything like that. Um, but everything is so strict and as a family member who visits, I can attest to the fact that many of the facilities, not all, but many of them make um, that family bonding very, very difficult um, and they actually discourage visiting. Um, family members are treated like criminals when we go in. And I know that there's the whole contraband thing and all that issue, uh, but there's ways that the department could um, address those issues without uh, doing things the way they do them now. Another question up at the back. Thank you. Just, just two brief comments. Uh, uh, let, sh sure, C question. Um, uh, I think there's an urgent, uh, urgency in these matters and more whites should be involved in this fight, in this struggle, because after they make all of the money they can off blacks and Hispanics, they're coming after you all too. Um, because greed knows no limits. Secondly, and quickly, it's not so much, not just what we can do for them on the inside, it's also what they can do for us, for the larger society. Dr. Kamara Jones said, with the genius that's being lost in our prisons, um, we could be farming on Mars if we would tap into the untapped genius that is being wasted and destroyed in our prisons. Good evening, thank you for your panel. Uh, I am a parent. I had um, uh, started my work in the community through the schools. And I've heard um, you speak about schools and different uh, ways that this affects our young. I have not heard you talk about the school to prison pipeline. With Georgia having 159 counties in this state, each county school board has their own dispensation of justice. What have you and the panel been doing toward the school to prison pipeline, especially with restorative justice when we're dealing with children who are 16 and younger and then they get fed into the system? Thank you. I think we had one more question, then we're going to have to. Actually, my question is similar to her because I know we're. One, I want to thank the panel for all your efforts, but I was thinking even partnering with educators because, for example, when teachers suspend young African-American males, they don't understand that those actions, like we have a high, very high suspension rate. Um, and they say that a lot of you know young African-American males are not being dropped out of school, they're being pushed out of school. So them not understanding the implications when you suspend this black boy, you're contributing to him going into the prison pipeline. When you encourage him to drop out, we mentioned the technical colleges. I used to work at the technical colleges. I knew of schools that would say, why don't you just go get your GED? They weren't even interested in helping them get a high school diploma. They knew it was an option for them to get their GED, so they would push them out of the school. So to me, it's like if we don't want to keep having these type of conversations 10 years down the line, what are we doing to be more proactive? And you know, as a community member, I also work with Randy with GCO. We're trying to be proactive and, and educate people, even the young people, this is how you get into prison. You know, these are some of the things you can do to avoid. But I think that if we don't want to keep having these type of conversations, we're going to really need to be more proactive and partner with people in the community that are really, even if they're ignorant of it, that they're actually uh, contributing to, to this issue. So I think we've got each panelist maybe, you know that we were, got a lot of questions there, but maybe 30, 45 seconds on, on maybe one of them. That, um, I'll, I will give my time up to somebody else. I can't <laughs> say anything in 35 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good lawyer's answer. <laughs> yeah.
Mark. Well, I would add, uh, glad you brought up the school to prison pipeline. I would ask you to look at what we've done in Texas. We've required districts to use uh, alternative measures before uh, kicking kids out of school. Um, and it is grossly disproportionate across a whole range of uh, factors as far as students, including special ed status, race, and so forth. And uh, we, you know, in the 1950s, there was often a two parent family at home when you suspended a kid out of school. We found in Texas, they're likely to get caught up in gangs, be hanging out at convenience stores, 32 times more likely to be arrested when you're out of school suspension versus when you're in school. Mm -hmm. So we need perhaps uh, service, school service, after school, after school programs. They need more school, not less. Mm -hmm. So we got to correct that. That, that won't improve until we just admit, and the same thing with the criminal justice system, but we fail. When there's not a single school district in this state that can guarantee that more than half of the African-American students who show up in kindergarten will graduate at the end of 12 years, then that's a failure. We should expect more of a system that our government operates. Uh, and then I think we should eliminate zero tolerance policies, and we've got to get over the, the uh, when in my work, in terms of examining uh, systemic issues of racism, the most persistent is, uh, is residential racism. And that's the same way we fund our school systems, by the tax basis of where people live. Until we decide that every child, whether you live in 30303 or 30458, deserves the same quality of education, the same funding, then we won't reach that problem. But it's, a, it's an important question. I think the, the answer to it begins in what Ms. Poole said, restorative justice. Just lifting up that as a concept and idea, educating yourself about that, and letting that be a, a theme throughout the work is important. I've, I've worked with many people that operate alternative schools, and they say for, for boys particularly, a lot of the reason they get there, they, they misbehave, it's because they can't read. And when they're called on to read, they're embarrassed. Mm -hmm and they end up acting up, mm. and they get sent to alternative school, and that starts their decline. And, and so it really goes back to fundamentally access to good education. That's right. Well, on that note, uh, thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us in Atlanta this evening. Um, and uh, thanks again to the panel. Um, we're uh, having uh, drinks and some snacks, so I'd be delighted if you'd join us afterwards. Thank you. 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 Thank you.